Mr. Pharaoh, you sent me ah, Mr. Mind map. <laughs> this long mind map, Mr. Pharaoh, <laughs> about quality of experience as opposed to quality of service, which is actually top of mind for us because one of the things we've been dealing with in the packet pushers world is SD WAN. And when you deal with software defined WAN, your wide area network frequently has internet circuits where you can't actually do QoS. QoE becomes very important. So, uh, so Greg, kick us off with uh, what QoE is. So I think the, the trick here is, is that a lot of people look at QoS as how I make my data network prioritize packets. But that's yeah. not actually what you're trying to achieve. What you're trying to achieve is you're trying to give the user an experience, a robust, predictable experience for their application. Now, in the days of networking, when you were just looking at packets and all you cared about was, you know, getting a packet from A to B, and only thing that you could do was get a packet from this router to that router, well, guess what? Your, everything you did was limited by your packet mindset. So you couldn't actually care about the user's experience of the network because you had no way of doing anything about it. You didn't have control of the apps. You had no control of your bandwidth. You couldn't control how many packets went into your router. But really what you were trying to achieve, but with the wrong tool set was what I call the principle of least astonishment. That is... The network should always respond in the way that is least likely to astonish the user. Now, in ah. particular, this is driven by uh, a key transition in the market, which is consumer internet. When people pick up their, their smartphone these days, you know, pick it up, do you often get performance problems with this? Did not often, no. Or some people whine about the tower now and again, but, you know, on the device itself, no, which I think is sure. your point. So this, this has become the benchmark for performance of your corporate network. Now, a lot of people say, you know, it should be perfect and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is no. The reality is that people ex don't expect your network to be, you know, uncongested, no drop packets, blah, blah, blah. What they actually expect for it to be is roughly about this. And your average desktop user will be, you know, as long as the print job doesn't take too long, that's okay. That'll be all right. We'll be able to make do with that. As long as you're, you know, you click a button and it doesn't take more than half a second for that screen to refresh, they'll be okay with that, right? What's more importantly is that it's consistently the same. So if I click a button, it doesn't matter if it's two seconds, as long as it's always two seconds. Because if you get it fast sometimes and slow at others, what's the thing that they complain about? The slow at others. I, I could argue against a few points. <laughs> One of those would be some people do get used to crap performance. So you can have bad performance. And if it is consistent, they won't complain about it anymore because they're used to it sucking. Uh, doesn't yes. mean you don't have a problem. There is something that could be fixed there. You know, another point worth mentioning is that you were talking earlier about how you know, we just had kind of bad tools, you know, and QoS is kind of a, kind of a bad set of tools. And, and I, I was reading just an article by uh, Pete Welcher over at NetCraftsman um, very recently where he described what QoS is really all about is creating winners and losers. That is at a moment of congestion on the network where not everyone's going to make it through because the internet or the interface you're trying to send all your traffic through is mm. full. Someone's going to win and someone's going to lose, and that's what QoS is all about. And I think you use QoS as part of your QoE experience. Even our limited QoS tools that we've had for a long time start to fall apart completely when we're dealing with the internet because you can no longer do the sort of setting of winners and losers. or You have very limited capability in the traditional QoS sense that you had. QoE then becomes something else that I believe yeah. the SD Wanders have given us new tools and new ways of looking at the network that are not packet by packet, but, but flows. Do you want to do the dumping on Quas first? Or do you want to talk about how we make it better first? <laughs> because you've kind of made the statement that Quas kind of works, but kind of breaks down in the internet era. My point would be is that Quas has never worked. I'll make this argument. If you, if you were to like take my QoS course that I've got up on Ignition, um, one of the points I make is that um, bandwidth is actually where you need to start. You better get your bandwidth right. QoS isn't going to fix uh -huh. that problem. And I also make the point that QoS is difficult and creates a lot of technical debt. So to mm -hmm. feed back into your point about... QoS has never worked. Well, it does work and it can work. Mm -hmm. However, once you've established a QoS paradigm that does work for you, keeping it going in the face of an ever-changing network is a problem you're going to chase forever and makes it very yes. difficult to keep it going. So there is technology there that is functional uh, and can work. But from a practical perspective, getting it to that point is incredibly hard and then incredibly hard to keep it going over yes. years as the network morphs. The rough rule of thumb for a diff serve co-op implementation is that you can take about one-fifth of your traffic and prioritize it. 
And that's the guarantee that you can, maybe you can get it to 30%, depends on the bandwidth and the app and a few bits and pieces, but you know, 20 to 30% and everything else doesn't just gets best effort pretty much, right? You can sort of do some fiddling there around the edges. But at the end of the day, you can... Well, there's, your there's idea a few of, service providers that have created some very dramatic QoS profiles that are like, Pharaoh, would you just stop because they have 12 classes or something crazy that they've managed yeah. to work? Not that anyone touches it now that it's working, but you know, there are occasional examples like that out there. Yeah, you can go to... You can talk to people like uh, Jeremy and he talks about his 12... 12 deep cost strategy that works fine for him. But really when you're doing that, you're only guaranteeing one fifth of the bandwidth for certain applications under certain circumstances, fingers crossed. So provided you do, you know exactly what the application is, you know exactly how much of it there is, and it doesn't exceed the reserved bandwidth. And you've got your queue depths correct, another huge thing then. Yeah, and you own all the hops. So you'd have to have a hop by hop by hop by hop, right? And you have to have mm -hmm. everything that's in the hop exactly configured correctly to sustain all of that. It only works on devices that actually do quas. So as soon as you put a firewall in the way, bets are off. It only works when the bandwidth is guaranteed. So if you have a pipe from a telco, and let's say you bought a 50 meg on, uh, of, of bandwidth on a uh, one gig tail, right? What happens if that 50 gig, that 50 meg that you've bought is actually in a shared backbone? And that shared backbone for MPLS, for business class MPLS, is usually oversubscribed at about 20 to 1, 50 to 1. So you've only got, at any given point in time, you're running a 1 to 5% chance that your bandwidth isn't all available. So the 50 meg that you absolutely guaranteed yourself in a cost profile, in a buffer on the device saying, I've got this much bandwidth that I can absolutely guarantee, but you don't. There's a, a non-zero. You're yep. so cynical. You're telling me... Service providers oversubscribe, say it isn't so. And that, and that is a great point. Yeah. Now, you know, depending on what your SLA is, you may get an SLA from the provider that will guarantee bandwidth. I have worked with providers where you map your specific diff serve scheme into theirs, and mm -hmm. there are SLAs that you subscribe to from them, and you may be paying a premium price, et cetera. Without that, it, it is truly... Mm -hmm. I guess. But, but even the one-to-ones are still over, they still run on a shared backbone that's oversubscribed. There's actually no guarantees and we see this consistently. So customers who put SD-WAN solutions in, we'll talk more about yeah. how they know this, they yeah. put them on these guaranteed circuits that are theoretically absolutely and utterly guaranteed and find out that packet loss is 15% or 20% and that the jitter is 30% from, you know, between packets. Just just, several different people that once they put SD-WAN yeah. on and were using their private MPLS circuits, they expected, hey, this is yeah. going to be a premium circuit that performs in a premium way and actually mm -hmm. began comparing reported statistics from what the SLA measurements were of the SD-WAN tool over the private yeah. MPLS versus the public internet and thought the public internet a lot of times was better. <laughs> Yes, it's, exactly. It's so it's, I remember 15, 20 years ago when people, we just started doing IP telephony and I was talking to a company and they were just, they were able to do telephone call, telephone trunking, like long distance over the internet, uh, long distance uh, IP telephony, really so much cheaper than they were making a pot of money. And it turned out they were just trunking it over the internet. That like, this is back in the era of two meg tail circuits. And, you know, they were doing 96 companded voice calls in 32k of bandwidth. And this is in an era where everybody was running around going, oh, we've got a guarantee. To These guys were doing it 20 years ago, long before. And that was when my cynicism for Quas came in. Let's just go back to what I said there, right? If you have all these things configured and you have all these guarantees, even if you've done everything perfectly and you've got the most elite Quas strategy and you know exactly what's happening in each one of these Quas groups and you've got the right ACLs and the buffers and the depths and the, you know, you've got the discard policies, you know whether you're tail dropping or you're ra random early discard or whatever it is, right? You still got no guarantee it will work. The only guarantee you can go back to the business is should go, should be all right most of the time. That's not a guarantee, right? <laughs> I think you're overstating it a little bit, but, but, but I get your point, particularly when there's some significant component of the infrastructure that you don't own. When I went to a handful of IETF meetings a few years ago, I remember sitting down with one of the people who was in the cost working, I think it was Sue Hares, and she said, oh yeah, she, she said, no, we really wanted RSVP, Resource Reservation mm -hmm. Protocol. That was really what we saw. When that failed, we had to do something. All the vendors got together and said, we've told customers that we can do cost. And they worked out that diff serve was this other idea that had been discarded because it was dumb and impractical and the wrong thing. And they took it out, buffed it off and put it out. So when you talk to the people who invented diff serve, 
they will tell you it was a dumb idea right from the start, but we didn't do it to make it work. We did it because there was a business reason to do so. That also made me a little bit cynical about <laughs> it. Right? Now, I also remember people who have been in the industry for you know, the last 10 years may not be familiar with the resource reservation protocol unless you're doing it in MPLS. But that failed for its own reasons back in the era because holding the state in every router never worked because router code is never reliable enough to actually hold state on a predictable basis. So we know that resource uh, RSVP failed for very good reasons and it only works today um, because everybody believes it It still doesn't work. RSVP TE is not actually all that popular because routers are very bad at holding state because the code isn't good enough or the quality of the devices isn't good enough to do that. So, okay, so, so, so of, we've, beat on, we've beat on the state yeah. of the industry you know, pretty thoroughly and I think, um, um, although some of your points, Mr. Farrow, are maybe a little exaggerated, uh, you know, the point, the point is fair. I get the point. So, well, so let's, let's transition. Let's back to my principle of at least astonishment. You mm -hmm. want to give the user a network that has no astonishment. It works exactly the way it should work. So I think we sort of outlined a case here that DiffServe can work unexpectedly. You, it just doesn't work the way you think, especially when you've made guarantees and spent vast amounts of time and resources buying these super high quality devices with expensive software and licenses and then spent hundreds of hours configuring a cost policy and the best you're going to get is eh, should work should work. <laughs> should work usually does most of the time right that's that's a pretty bad argument that's like let's say you went down to the car yard and the guy said yeah 95 percent of the time the car will go <laughs> Welcome to Quas. So that's my beef about Quas. I've got a lot more detail in there I could unpack for you, but not in today's session. Um, I think what we'll do is let's make this part one. So what we've done is we've laid out the fact that quality of experience is important and why Quas isn't enough. It just doesn't go far enough to guaranteeing the users that the application experience will matter because Quas has got you focusing on packets. Let's face it, Quas isn't even looking at flows and flows is where the user experience is. And that's one thing we didn't talk about. So maybe we'll talk about how do we solve this cost problem? How do we generate quality of experience? And how do we solve it in the next video? Watch out for the next one on the YouTube channel. We'll see you there.